What's up, everybody? Can you guys hear me? It's Money Shot here. Um, we are ready to go, guys. We are. Um, we have a special guest who goes by the name of Seb. Uh, Want to give you a background about uh, Seb? He he watched a couple of our HTS videos. Uh, he has a unique story, and he shared in the comments that um, he he got banned. Um, and the casino just banned him for for being such a great shooter uh at his local casinos and um gr he he has great stories i chatted with him offline and it, it's great to have him here a lot of people interacted with him on the comments and they were interested in hearing his story so um glad for all of you guys to join us we got about 40 people right now we got toothpick ted in the house uh toothpick is here let's see if i can do this there you go he's driving home from reno he's gonna try and listen in we got john uh croson good afternoon from sunny california tommy t sizzle is here to listen in hello all blackburn in the house and then we got Alan Genoza, Alan G. He's he has a question for Seb. Question: Would tipping the dealers get the pit boss to look the other way? I will save that question for our Q and A at the end. If you guys have any questions, put a Q in um, Q capital Q in the beginning, and I'll flag it, and then we can go ahead and uh, address the questions afterwards towards the end. And I'll be sure to answer any of you guys' questions or Seb short for Sebastian, he can go ahead and um, answer those questions for you. OBC is in the house. Wow, we got a lot of people. One Rocky Fool. Abdullah is here. Don't know banning shooters is now a thing in the casino. Uh, Gail is from uh, Ohio. Derek Diaz, can't wait to hear on this e very exciting topic. <laughs> It should be an exciting one. I'm looking forward to it. With no further de debut, uh, we got Seb on the line. Let's introduce Seb. He wants to remain anonymous, um, but here we go. Hey, welcome, Seb. Hey, how's it going, Brian? <laughs> How you doing? Uh, you want um, you want to mention where you're you're airing from? I know you're East Coast, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Pennsylvania, but I'm um, originally from New York. All right. I'm excited to have you on HCS, our channel, and and to have you here tell your story. Very unique story um, that you have. I I don't know much people who've been banned for being good at tossing the dice, and, and here you are sharing your story with everyone on Hawaii Crab Shooters. This is amazing to have you. So I thank you for being on our channel. Oh, no problem. Uh, thanks for having me. So, okay. um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Like I got into, um, you know, how I got into craps in the first place was uh, a Vegas trip. So it was in 2011. And back then I actually never gambled before. I think I went once in 2009 to Vegas and I think I literally just played, uh, like a slot, like a slot machine blackjack, like video blackjack. And I think I lost like you know, a few hundred dollars. And I was like, this is stupid. So I never did it again. Then in 11, I went. Um, and then at that point, um, I was playing like, you know, I was there for about five, six days, I think, and playing kind of like the big, big six wheel. I was actually trying to mathematically figure out how to beat the wheel. And then uh, my brother's a big gambler. And he's a younger brother. And I didn't, obviously, you know, I had never gambled before. So it's not like I introduced him. So he's like, let me show you some real games. Don't play that stupid game. And then he's like, I'm going to show you table games. So he he took me out um, on my last night there. It was actually St. Patrick's Day, which is funny. And um, he uh, showed roulette, how to play roulette. And so he's a big better. You know, he brings like, I think he brought like maybe like $10,000 with him. So I like, I think he lost like $2,000 um, just like that roulette. And he couldn't win a single spin. So then we walk over to the craps table and it's like literally full. It's like Bellagio. It's like a Tuesday night or something. And um, we find two spots, just um, him and me. And uh, at that point, you know, I was out there with my mom and my aunt and uh, my wife at that time. So 
and now ex-wife, right? So she, uh, so they're all kind of hovering over us, you know. So I roll the dice, like I don't know what I'm doing, you know. I just you're supposed to, you know, just take these dice and throw them. So I just, I just sevened out like immediately, and you know, the first time for a man is usually like bad luck, right? They say, but you know. So I was like, um, then he rolled, and he he's just a random roller too. He just throws them as hard as he can, actually, at the back wall, and we both sevened out so quickly. I think he was down like another, I don't know, two thousand dollars. Or, or more. I know he was. He was down. He was. He was probably down over five thousand, if I remember. It's all a blur to me. So then we take a break. Um, we go to. Um, oh, I sent. I send off the wife. I give her some money and, and let her go play blackjack by herself somewhere. And my mom and my aunt. Um, they also go to play slot machines. So once we drop them off, we start like circling the casino, and we lose our spot at that table. So we see like another table, and. Um, all I remember was it was really quiet and like we try to get in and like everybody there was like the table's really not good and it sucks right now. So we walked around a little bit and we came back and two spots opened up. So probably was really bad and two people just left. So we walk in and the dice came to me pretty quickly and I just caught a heater. Like I rolled for 45 minutes. I just, this is a blur. And my, you see, I didn't know what I was doing. $10 table. My brother starts $50 a number. And then 50 pass and max odds. So, you know, three, four, five are the odds. So all I remember was at, at towards like the end of my role, when I finally sevened out, he had um, $3,000 on each number. And um, he also had pass line maxed out um, and odds. So whatever, I think his pass line must have went up to like 500. And then, you know, he had maxed that. And then he would place the number on top of that. So he wanted it. So he had 3000 on every number, you know, if the point, you know. so by the time he was done, yeah, now he was like, then, then he rolled and he rolled for like probably 30 minutes. So yeah, now he's, <laughs> yeah, back. so he goes from being down. Like, I think seven, I, it had to be, I had to be seven. Ugh. All I remember is he went from being down six or seven to being up $7,000. So oh. he had left 18,000 on the table on my roll. Um, and what he does, he goes, press, press, collect. So every number doesn't matter four or 10 press, press, collect. So then we get like a dinner comp on us. And then we put, um, uh, my mom, my aunt, he sends them to the, he puts them on the plane there to catch their flight. So it's now it's just me, him and, and the ex. And then I sent her off somewhere again. I gave her some of my winnings and then we go back, I think the same table. And then we get in there and then I roll for like, I think it was like 20. 25 minutes he rolled for like like 45 minutes and then the third guy rolled after him rolled for like an hour and and he was a random roller and he was like i've never had a roll like this in my life and we're all random rollers but and all i remember is in my role my brother's really like he's really like i guess he had done some kind of mind tricks on the on the pit bosses because when I was rolling, they would keep saying, oh, it would be terrible if a seven comes right now. Like they would literally say the box person or the pit boss would literally just say the number seven as loud as as many times he has a chance to say seven. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and like, but like, yeah, he would diffuse it. He'd be like, while I was set, like I would actually I got into a thing where I started setting the dice. And for some reason, like the six, four set was working. But when I would pick up the dice, I would still like take them in my hand and I would just kind of like shuffle them in my hand. So it didn't matter. Right. But it was working. And he kept saying like a mantra. He'd be like, do it for the fate of the world and like do it for basketball. So he's saying like the most bizarre, um, silly, illogical mantra out loud, like while I'm like taking the dice, I'm trying to find the six four and then I'm holding them. And then I would like whisper the same mantra under my breath. And like, it just, we had this magic because me and my brother, like, we just like, I, you know, he's, he's like my baby brother. I, I love him. So I was like, we had a connection and, you know, I have like that beginner's naivety, right? Where I don't even know what I'm doing. I, I think I the whole night I made like $1,800, like a joke. <laughs> so you, you, these were the beginning before you even uh, applied uh, Dice Influence. So how'd you get into Dice Influence afterwards? All right, so I, I after the Vegas trip, I'm like psyched about dice, and there's like a local casino near me, which I had never been to, like, and I had lived in that town for like uh, probably at that point, um, 
five years. So almost six years. Yeah, five. So I've never been there. So I'm like, let me go try my luck there. You know, I got a little bankroll. So I go there and it's like, oh, it's not working. You know, like the six four is not working. Then I'm like mm -hmm. trying everything, throwing them randomly and trying to throw them soft or nothing is working. I keep sevening out before like I even start getting some numbers pressed. So, so then I'm like, okay, you know, I start researching craps. I start researching the don't, the don't come, the don't pass, don't go. I'm like playing, playing it both ways, you know, uh -huh. like every strategy I could think of just to make like a couple hundred dollars on the night, you know, not like the monster rolls we had. Um, oh yeah, by the way, my brother ended up making 27,000 that night in, um, in craps, like pop. he made more, he was in a deficit. So he, he just, you know, he actually got to $18,000 again on, on the, I think the guy that was after him, that guy, he got all the numbers up for 3000 and, you know, 18,000 on the table before the seven came. So, so I'm back there. Nothing's working. Um, I go on, I don't know. Somehow I just went on the, went somewhere. Uh, I don't know how dice, I, I think the Frank school bloody books, the golden, like his book, the golden Dutch books. Yeah. So, Frank Scobletti, he got, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I saw that his book somewhere on Amazon or I or I watched a video on YouTube and like the gold, like, you know, Dom, the Dominator and all that were like that, that documentary. I think that was on History Channel or something. So right. I buy all his books. I start looking into like, you know, the game, how to, you know, what, what the odds are, all this, like the real statistics. And then somewhere I'm like, OK. This guy, the dominator is like, you know, he's a setter. So I go on eBay and I buy some, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't really into, you know, that handy to make my own setup. So some guy sold a little rig for like a hundred bucks and ship. You get like the back wall, you know, with, with the diamonds and you get, and then you get a little mini version of it. We can, it's called the travel version. And then of course you get the hardest part was I should have gotten real dice. He, he gave me used dice. I think the holes were drilled in them. And um, also like a book on how to bet, you know, about press and collect, which I didn't really know about. Because my brother never taught me like how he's doing the press, press, collect. He told me later. So I start practicing, you know, and then I thought I'm going to take my skills to the casino, right? So this is like spring of 2011. I think I got the rig and all that by May. Well, and, that's um, three years ago. So two th oh, two, uh, 13 years you've been doing this. 13 years. Yeah. yeah. Years, yeah. So, at that point, you know, when I get into something and I'm really interested in it, like I, I just, it's like kind of all consuming for me. And at that time, you know, I was, uh, and it was unrelated to this, but uh, I believe, but like, you know, I, I went through a separate, right after the Vegas trip, literally a month later, we get separated and we're like in the process of divorce. And so that I just focus my attention on there. And then I go to, I go to that local casino one night and there's this older guy, like he's probably like 70, you know, and he, um, he's, I know about now. I know about stick man left one and two. And, and there's this guy standing right there and there's enough space between, I could fit in, uh, you know, closer to the stick. And I say, Hey, can I, can I shoot here? He goes, that's my spot. I'm like, Hey, it doesn't matter. You know, I can shoot. How about, how about to your right? You know, stick man too. So anyway, like this guy rolled like 51 rolls and I think my night was like kind of mediocre. You know, I, I was just getting into it. This guy was a dice setter. He's all about the three V so I got his number. He would come in town because um, cause his daughter would have cheerleading uh, competitions in the town. So eventually, like, he lived in Jersey. So then I'd go to, like, AC and he, like, you know, I didn't have any my credit, you know. So he, like, in terms of, like, a player's card or anything. So I, he would, like, get me a room. And we just hit up the tables. And um, I met other, like, dice rollers there at that casino, too. And I, ha I wasn't really, I'd say, at that point, I was not, like, I was not good. Um, but when we went to Valley's. Uh, went back when Bally's was open, I caught a roll and I think I hit a five point fire bet. Um, and you know, he's, he started like saying, okay, you got something here. You got to practice. You got to practice. And so I started doing a hard way mostly every once in a while, three V set. Um, and then I found like the come out set, you know, where you can come out craps. I would have the yo set with the ace deuce showing and on the sides would be the four, three for the sevens. So I started trying to throw sevens on the come out and 12s and 11s and then you know once the point got set then i would start to like you know throw hard ways so i don't know at some point that year in 2011 i started to get uh, like a little bit of a reputation um for for because everybody there nobody set the dice like they literally were like i was probably the only um 
like real like dice center. Every one and every once in a while you see somebody kind of try, but I always noticed that when they said hardways, they would always seven out really quickly because they put too much spin. So I started like adapting my technique so that I was like minimize the backspin as much as possible. In fact, try to throw it as flat as possible, like with no spin. And um, a couple of times, you know, like you could call it like coincidence and I caught a roll or whatever, but it started, I started to get a little notorious because people like the big betters, you know, they would start to bet, bet, um, bet big on me. And um, a story that I didn't tell you about was, was this one young guy. I and mean, he must've been like a, like a weed, like he must've dealt some drugs like marijuana or something. Cause he looked like, he looked like, you know, why does this kid have money? Or he, you know, maybe he's just a rich kid, but he, he'd show up like a Puma suit. And then he, he would bet big, like hundred dollars on each number um, inside. And then a hundred pass and 500 odds for the five, six and eight. So he's, I just, I just remember being recognized. Like that was the first time I got recognized because I would catch rolls, but you know, I'd get up into thirties, forties on rolls uh, often. And, you know, they said, they send in like the guy to like mop up, you know, like it's like two in the morning and I'm on a 45 minute roll. And um, when you say mop up the cooler, you're talking about the coolers. Yeah. Like the janitor's got to come. All of a sudden he's got to sweep by my feet, you know, and, or like, he's got to sweep the shelf. Like he's got to clean the shelf and there's not even a single thing there. So I'm like, <laughs> well, there's nothing here. And they, then they would start saying like, oh, they're sending the cool. Like people would tell me they're doing it on purpose. I'm like, really? I was like, that is crazy. Cause this doesn't make sense. So, mm -hmm. oh, by the way, back then I used to drink. So like, I, I it's not like the alcohol. I would just be like, I would pretty much be, I mean, heavily buzzed. Right? Like there's no way. I mean, I can still because I wasn't like drunk, but for some reason it must have given me confidence. So I don't how many do that. years uh, since two, 2011, when did you start uh, you know you were perfecting your skills? Huh? Uh, what year would that be already? Um, uh, it, was, it was quick. I mean, I would say like it's such a blur because of all the drinking, but like I would say probably somewhere in 2011, like within like two, three months of getting that rig, you know, um, I was, I consider myself <laughs> I, I was good. So like I could, I could definitely, I had a dealer tell me that like that was dealing me black jack that would regularly deal me craps. He's like, they don't like you here. Cause the average, um, the roll to seven ratio is like 4.3 at this casino. And you're like, well above that. I'm like, do you think I'm above six? He's like, uh, there's a very bouncy table. So he's like, you're, you're probably right around six. So I never paid attention cause I never wrote down my rolls. But then this old guy told me, start writing down your rolls, you know, like, keep track so so I, I i have all those notepads i don't even know like you know where they are anymore i used to i started tracking later on not even in 2011 so i'd say somewhere i mean somewhere by that fall i was probably good and um so this one you, um so from 2011 you've been doing good your, your skills has been perfected you're making money the casino is now recognizing you for your skill uh when did the 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 process of ending you in getting banned happened. What year was that? Yeah, I, I, that had to be somewhere in the spring of 2012. Um, I don't know if it was winter or spring, like February, maybe. Uh, there was a, it was a one night, like, you know, five in the morning, we're all playing crap still. And I think I was playing some other game like roulette or blackjack. And I walked over to craps. It was a guy betting a hundred dollars in the horn. So, mm -hmm. I didn't know that he was kind of doing that like um, quite often, not like every role, but he would pick and choose his spots. All I remember is throwing, a, um, throwing aces. And all of a sudden I hear like, he just goes, yes, you know? And then, um, and then he goes, if you do it again, I'll give you 50 bucks, you know? So I was like, yo, that was a mistake. You know, what's that the hard ways that can happen. Right. So I'm like, okay. So the next roll was a 12. So he was like, he threw me 50 bucks. I was like, this is awesome. You know, like, this is cool. Like I wasn't betting on the horn. I never really did. So two weeks later, scenario repeated where the same guy was there and he did it. It happened again. It could have been 12 and two this time, whatever it was. It was the same two 30 to one payouts. And when he hit it for a hundred, he pressed it to 200, he gave me 50 bucks again. And apparently I didn't hit the back wall with both dice. Like each time I threw the dice, one of them hit the back wall. And I always try to hit the back wall. I know that rule, but you can't control it all the time. And so it happened again. And then the the the, the pit boss, well, he was a dual rated. So he goes, you're banned from throwing the dice until shift change. I'm like, 
Why? Because you didn't hit the back wall both, both times. I'm like, but you know I'm not trying to hit aces or 12. You know I'm trying to hit the point is six. Come on. He goes, I, I was like, how long? He goes, well, that's about an hour. So I was banned for an hour. So I thought it was kind of funny. I waited an hour and I went back to throwing. Now, that was probably the beginning of a warrant. I, I started getting tracked. Because like, like I said, I don't really bet big, but people bet big on me. And then um, it was Friday the 13th, April 2012. Yeah, Friday the 13th. And then there was a table that was a daytime table. It was, you know, it was like probably three in the afternoon. And it was a cold table. And some new kid that never knew the game, he just said like, come on, yo, I want to yo. And he had like a $5 pass line or something or $10. I think he had a $10 pass line. I said, look, take five of that dollars. It's a $5 game and put that $5 on the world bet. Or if you really want the yo, put it on the yo. So he goes, all right. And he, I think he literally put a $5 yo. And I set the, you know, the yo and I threw it. And then he was all excited. I'm like, now either press it or keep it the same. And I think he kept the same. I threw another yo. So... At this point, I already had there was animosity towards me by a couple of the uh, box persons. I never had problems with the dealers, but there was a particular box person that used to really like grind me. It's just rude. Mm -hmm. So I remember one day just letting her have it, like you know, just gave her the language. And that box person was the she was the dual rated that day, and one of her like lackeys, like I guess he was a kiss up to her. He was the box. So he's sitting there, and, and then when he sits down, he notices that, you know, the table would go cold when I, like, there'd be like 10 people at the table. I, and I'd throw, I'd hit a couple of points, you know, and then it would go all the way around back to me. Nobody would hit a point, you know. They might throw some come out sevens and elevens, but no point. And it came to me again, and the point was six, and then he goes to me, like, before I even start rolling, he's just, right there, he's just challenging me. Like, um, he goes, you have 10 seconds to throw the dice. I'm like, is that a rule? He's like, um, yeah. Like I said, so when does the count start? He goes, as soon as the stick pushes the dice and pulls the stick back, um, that's when you start. So, so I was like, can you count for me? And he started counting. Like what? So I set the hard six and I waited for him to get to like five. And I, I, I got to five on the release. Uh, he says six, and I threw the hard six, and I said, hey, look at that, a hard six on the six count, and. Wow, I didn't break any rules there. And both dice hit the back wall. And um, he was like, he looked over at her. She made a phone call. And about 10 minutes later, I got a, you know, I got a tap on the shoulder. It was the vice president of the casino. And said that I'm, um, he pulled me over and he said, look, you know, at that point, they, you know, they know who I am. I have a player's card, you know. Um, I, I played a lot to have a good tier status. And he said, you're banned from um, throwing the dice in this casino. Uh, ever again you can bet on craps and you can play any other you just can't throw them. and i said what? he goes you know we've talked to you a few times about the back wall i was like look I, I was like i said what it is like you guys you guys are pestering me you know i don't even bet big i'm like a ten dollar pass line ten dollar odds guy you know like so he, he said you're done so at that point that was my last day that i played um at that casino i just like never went back um in the 2012. So you were yeah. you banned for life or just uh, for a temporary uh, period again? Well, I, I like he said, <laughs> I am banned from life from throwing that. <laughs> so you can you can go in the casino, play anything else, bet on craps, but you can't throw the dice, and that that's what they have in their system. Yeah, and and they knew my name. Obviously, they obviously knew what I looked like. So um, I don't wow. know it, something about like I. I just, it, it let me down. You know, I actually wrote them up. I wrote them up to the uh, gaming commission and that didn't work. So yeah. uh, what they, was their explanation for management for you not being able to throw the dice? Did they give you, they, they no, give you an explanation? No explanation other than I, that you're too good. <laughs> yeah. I Writing either, like nothing in writing. And like, I don't even know, like if he said, um, like if you throw the dice, then you're breaking the law. He didn't even say that. He didn't trespass me. Mm -hmm. Um, and he knew me actually, like he was friendly with me. He said it in the nicest way possible. So that, at that, I was like, wow. And I told my buddy about it and he's like, wow, that's, that's crazy. So, I mean, it must be because I, because I rub it in, you know, like I rubbed it in and they wanted to exert their authority over me and they probably, you know, I mean, I went through bad streaks. People would lose money on me, but when when the, the when the roll was good, you know, like they would, people would make a few thousand on my rolls. Um, you know, betting like starting with like twenty five dollars a number, 
And uh, they would literally cash out after my rolls. And I would just stick around because I was like a craps junkie and I just lose everything I made back. Yeah, I made like a 400, 8,000. Well, you said uh, the, 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 the pit boss had a lot of different tactics. Before they banned you, they did a lot of questionable things uh, to when you were shooting. Can you share some of those stuff? Oh, yeah. Like, you know, I get, it's I definitely piss you off. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, anything like you got you got the you got the people coming and you know they're doing the um they're cleaning up when they don't need to you got um essentially like one time if i don't hit the back wall with both dice you know every time like they wouldn't even give you like nowadays the rule is like three if you don't do it three times in a row they speak to you so i you know with me it was like the first time um and and i would switch you know oh that was the other one or oh keep it eye level so i started to figure out that if I throw the dice with a like decent amount of arc, like, you know, I saw one one time a guy do this. So then I was like, oh, he has something. There was a guy that was like ridiculous. He would throw them so high. They'd be like literally like 15 feet high in the air or something like that, you know. And then they'd stay on the table and I watched him just roll for like 30 minutes. So they never said anything to him. But then again, I never saw him before or after that. So I started to do that, but not that ridiculous. I mean, I'm six one, so I would throw it probably it'd probably go like eight feet high and you know they wouldn't bounce off the table it's not like they kept i was slowing up the game because they would bounce off the table because i would throw them close enough to the back wall that they would hit and uh stay on the table so i started noticing that wow this works like the hard i started like you know i went i had a phase where the hard ways i was sevening out all the time because i was over rotating one of them you know pitching the one die so that wasn't happening anymore i started catching the low rolls and you know it was things were going good and they'd be like high level and i'm like what's eye level your eye level or my eye level because sometimes a stick person is 411 and sometimes a stick person is six foot five he's like you know what i mean like um i'm like what do you mean because i'm not going to be able to do for like 411 that's ridiculous so, you know that's like literally just throwing it <laughs> rolling it down the table so um they never so we want to keep an eye on the chips i'm like oh so you the rule is the rule is you want to keep so what do you mean it was well somebody could swipe chips off us i'm like that's bs you know nobody would try that um so i knew that there was something to the the, the arc i knew it i knew it had to be because you know i played basketball growing up and you know i know I, you know arc is you look at steph curry like all that arc you know like for three pointers so i said arc must kind of con diffuse if your if your dice are off angle arc must minimize somehow minimize the uh, effect of how they can just go off in different directions. So that was another thing they would do to me. Um, the timer was the funniest. That was like the last straw because they said I started to take too long with the dice. I don't know where that came from. I really didn't take a long time, you know, like well, pretty much. Casinos, they have a rule in certain, not in Vegas, but um, they give you a five second uh, rule that, and some don't even allow you to set dice. Like in Reno, some areas they don't. Yeah. Let you even set. So. Yeah, the Wendover. Yeah. Yeah. You can't set the dice in like the Caribbean. Like if you go to Atlantis, you can't set them in Atlantis. I don't think you can set them on cruise ships, certain cruise lines. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, and 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 so what happened is, I I, I moved back. Like this is Pennsylvania. I went back to New York, and after a couple of years, started playing, but I started going to like Connecticut. You know, I started going to like uh, Mohegan Sun. And then I was like, wow, they have the fire bet. Because this local casino didn't have anything. They had no side. They had no hop bets. They had no prop bets. Um, so I, I go out there and I, I get really into it because of the I wanted to throw a six-point fire bet. And, um, you know, I got a bunch of five-pointers. I could never get to the six. I could establish the six, which is good. I could lay against that six-point. So I played a lot. And I, I started to notice the different tables. I, I knew how those tables are hard tables. They were good tables. And I went to, you know, I went to AC a few times, never went back to Vegas. Um, so I saw that, like, there's something to this. Um, but I, my problem is always fear. Like, I'm just always afraid to lose. So, like, you know, I'll be, I'll bet minimum, like $10, odds 10. You know, each number I'll pick, like, 6 and 8, like $10, you know, 12 each. Or right. So if, if I, I never really made money. In fact, I was like, I was a loser. It's just the, the fearless gamblers, like my brother, you know, or like, you know, has your betting improved on uh, matching your, your uh, dice skill now? Yeah, so now, like, I actually started, um, I think it was, I went back to that casino 
and you know, ch walked around, never played craps like 2015. Um, and then like more recently, last year, I started going back there. And so it's I'm a lot, you know, I'm older now and got the gray hair, so you know, facial hair. So like all the people are gone. There's like literally three dealers left from my time. And I started playing again. But I didn't want to play that, so I started playing the roll to win table. And um, at first, I didn't really like that table, but then I've grown to like really like that table um, for many reasons. So my betting strategy is really just simple. I, I like the fact it's five dollar table, wait, and wait I start with five. So that same casino you're banned, you went back and they allowed you at least on the roll to win. Then they don't know. They they don't know oh, who I am. They just forgot about it. Yeah, because I actually yeah. you know when they asked me who I'm. Oh. I give him another. I give him another false name. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, good, good. But one of the dealers did actually remember me, and so far he hasn't communicated with anybody else um, because I don't think he knows I was banned. Um, so he he just says it's been a long time. You know how you been? I'm like I'm good, and and so um, I have you know like nobody's figured out who I am. You know like based on you know. I don't wear disguise. I wear like, I don't wear sunglasses or like this get up. Right. But, um, I'm just afraid that, you know, it might come up because, because the fact is like, I'm a senator and, um, I do consistently, if I roll like, like five times in the night, I, I think I 50% of the time I can roll into like past, uh, 16 rolls. So when you can start to actually, you know, make a little money and, um, you know, I, I find that they don't really, they don't, there's new set of dealers, like these young dealers, they don't really care. And, uh, so I started doing the, and, um, only one time a dealer spoke to me about eye level. I'm like, well, eye level on this table. Why? There's no chips. He's like, I'm just doing my job. And so I threw him a tip and I think I saw one of those questions about tips. So back then, yeah, I yeah. would tip. Like, I, I definitely tipped. If if I'm if there's a point, I throw them on the point for a dollar, and if the point is hard, I throw them on the the point for a hard way for a dollar. You know, piggyback. I was definitely sharing, you know. But you know, it doesn't matter if you tip the dealers because this is the management talking here. Um, the suits. I always call them the suits. You know, the suits. They don't care, and that I would always argue with suits, not with dealers. So now that I'm there, you know. Um, People, you know, there are people, now we have, we have a good group of shooters there. We have shooters that really uh, set the dice. They have, they have rigs at home, but I will tell you consistently I'm better than them. And the reason is because I don't practice. Like my, I play, I don't play with my, my little rigs at home. I consider like live play, like practice, your practice better. Yeah. You're, you know, there, there are some players like that. Um, they don't, they don't practice it. They know the fundamentals. They they put in their work at their practice rigs, but um, at their locals, they prefer practicing and getting their their toss, uh, you know, perfected on that table. Are you like one of those? Like for me, Fremont is one of my home is my home casino because I know that table very well. Um, yeah. So, and if you you're 20 minutes away from a casino, why practice when you can get the real thing and the real, what you're accustomed to instead of practicing on something else. So is that the case with you? That's why you don't practice? For me, like what level of comfort do you have with your, like how much you're betting, right? So if you're betting, I mean, I bet every shooter, like I don't even, like I'll qualify shooter. I don't do five count. I used to do like that. To me, that was just like missing out on good rolls, right? So when they get started. So I will literally, you know, make one throw most of the time. I throw one time and then I go five dollars across and I put a dollar on the skinny and the hard ways or dollars. So it's really I'm risking about $40 uh, per shooter. But pretty quickly, if you have five shooters at seven out and, you know, with me, it's like I, I press until I get my $30 back. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times I'll regress and I'm looking at that now as a mistake, like just press until you get mo your money back on the hit and just keep going, press, collect, press, collect. And the reason I like the roll to win table is I've seen like a lot of like long rolls, especially with repeat numbers. I'll see like, like eight fives, like in a day, if I'm there for like six hours, you know, on Saturday or Sunday, you will see one roll. Um, you might not, there's days you might not see them get into the thirties. You know, there'll be a, there's some people won't, you won't even break 24, but sometimes you get somebody roll eight fives 
you know, a random roller throw, you know, 37. He's the guy that you were waiting all day. Like even I'm having bad days because, you know, like obviously we're all human and we can't really perfect this strategy. But that was before I started arcing it. Um, and the thing is, if I'm having a bad day, I have a plan B. And that plan B is like, okay, dice settings not working. So I have this other weird thing where, and it does work because I had a 31 roll and a 35 roll on a Thursday night doing this because my dice setting for the first two tries, you know, I get to like 11 or 12, 11 or 12 every time I couldn't get past 11. So I said, something's wrong. So let me try this. So I take, you know, because the dealers there aren't cool enough to always know to give them as you lay, you know, that strategy, like as they lay. Mm. No, maybe if I see it, then I probably recognize that strategy. Okay, so like I learned this because I saw a dude doing this one time uh, in Mohegan Sun in Connecticut, and he was like, a, he looked like a, a guy that played a lot of craps throughout his life. So he was, he kept telling the, the stick person as they lay, as they lay. So whatever the dice land, right, and then they pull it into the middle, and then they flick them. You always notice how they flick them. So yeah, yeah. he told the dealer, and he was tipping them, right? So he's like, I'm, and he's all like, you know, look, I got you on the numbers all across as they lay, and he rolled. He rolled long, like he got, you know, he got like into the probably mid twenties, and um, and I realized what he meant. It's like he felt that there's a pattern that the, the way the dice lay and and keeping that like flow, like he was a, you know, how they say a rhythm roller, but he wasn't exactly a rhythm roller. More that he was at, like his rhythm was as they lay. So I started doing that and I started noticing it worked. But then when you know, when you watch people who do that, every sometimes you can see that. You know, up top is not showing seven, but you could see that facing the back wall from when they're throwing because I'm on the other side of the table. I see a seven and I, I would literally see them seven out when they would do that. So I said, what I'll do is I'll take the die and I'll flick them against the back wall because I that I like being against the back wall on these roll to win because that's a perfect distance for me. And if I if, if I when the dice land, if they don't throw a seven, I look all around. I don't see a seven. I'll throw those dice. Um, and that, to me, that, that sometimes when I'm a bad day throwing, that works because I have confidence in that. The main thing is you got to have confidence because, you know, like Greg Uloho, he's a bubble craps player, right? And he swears, do not show fear because these dice can, can smell your fear. Meaning somehow that computer, you know, like for whatever reason, like he's superstitious with the different presses, but for me. There are days when I know, like my dice setting, I'm like, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the zone. You know, when you get in the zone, mm -hmm. uh, I've been in the zone throwing the dice. I'll have people come up to me and say, um, like, if you want to hear the story, I could tell you later. But like when I, when I would go to AC with my friend and stuff and he'd be struggling, um, you know, I'm young, I was younger in my thirties. So, you, you know, you're younger, you're like, everything is, um, like if you're an athlete, you know, like you can understand body mechanics and what's going wrong. So being older now, it's kind of a little harder to, to, to always feel like what's going wrong. Like why am I throwing them off? But you just know you're doing something wrong. So you switch to a plan B. And the plan B, sometimes, the you know, the plan B works out. And if you go into like a really bad like rut, like, you know, when base, like pitchers, when pitchers go into a rut and they just can't throw like for like a week in a row like i had people like oh no it's him setting the dice so i started doing something different like something different that i thought could work and have confidence and i'll catch a roll so it all comes down to being at some point you an advantage player is not just somebody who throws the dice like sets the dice because i see plenty of people set the dice and they're terrible at it and even one even ones that practice it's because they're so focused on throwing the dice perfectly that they're literally, um, I think that they're, I, I can't, you know, you can't see, but they're probably really stressed inside. Because um, as soon as they like put a, you know, put odds on their roll, like, you know, they got the pass line, but they don't do odds. As soon as they put odds or they, they load up on the numbers, it's seven out. Which means that they're comfortable, you know, as shooters, not betting big on themselves, but other people are. But even then I've seen bad shooters and and it's always the same thing. They over pitch the one die. Um, but more recently, I've... I I I feel at this point I'm like I'm better than I was before. Yeah. Because back you know the ran the, the uh, roll to win. Um you know Dusty uh, Dusty Rolls talked about it in his comment. Um and I agree with Dusty. Uh, the one advantage of roll to win is that the dimensions are the same at every casino. 
and yeah. you can't say that for any live table. Um, yeah. Live table, there's no rules by Nevada Gaming of how big or small. Um, but for roll to win, there's a constant in the 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 bounce. Um, they're just the plexiglass and the sticky the sticky film on top. Um, but is that do you think that contributes to why there's so much longer rolls on that table than uh, the regular live tables? It has to be. I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, I also believe that it's the people at the table, right? So the 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 spec the the, the People playing the game, um, you can tell there's nights when there's, like I was telling you before, so, so when you even have random rollers, I mean, the guy who rolled eight fives was a random roller. Um, mm -hmm. we, you we said, attract you, said you, you were, you caught an 80 roll. Was it, was it you mentioning that story? 80 roll on the roll, roll to win? Was it? No, no there was a guy standing next to me that sets the dice, caught a 71 roll. A 51 roll? On there, seventy-one. Seventy-one. Sorry, your your internet was seventy-one roll. And were you so you were on that one? Seventy-one. I, I was next to. I was betting the numbers. I didn't. I, I stopped putting money on people, and I, I kicked myself. But you know, I would put. I would probably put like two dollars on. It. So, you know, like that is hundred. Yeah. That that is crazy. The reason why is, uh, you know, um, I, I just even the ladies roll long, like even uh. SJ, SJ's wife, uh, Hazel, rolled, rolled long to roll to win. Uh, one of our friends, Coach Rob, his wife, rolls long on the roll. It's it's just amazing how much big rolls there are on the roll to win, you know. And I, I, I don't play it as much because I just don't like the – I don't like how you got to go over because the separation between the terminal and, and where you throw the dice, it's – really awkward for me. I don't have long, you're six one, so you can reach over. Um, yeah. But I, I strongly believe if you can master the role to win, there's some serious money you can make on that. If you, you have a consistent toss, right? Yeah. Like at this point, I've gotten to the point where like, you know, I'm going to go and start pressing. Um, so like six and eight press, uh, press whether it's a six or cause I rolled 10 eights um, in 22 rolls, like one day. It was like right before the guy caught the 71. Um, and actually before that, two weeks before that, there was a 27 roll followed by a 73 roll followed by another 27 roll. And then when I got there, um, that was an hour late, right, to that. I missed it. But then when I got there, within an hour of me there, and it wasn't me that got the roll, a guy got a 41 roll followed by a 26 roll and a 25 roll. So... And the 26 roll guy, the tw the 41 roll guy was setting the dice. The 25, the second one was the 25 actually. He was a random roller. And then the third person, uh, I can't remember what they were doing, but I was like, you don't see this on the regular table. So I, I think that if the people, like, you know, people, I think they have more confidence because it's $5, you know, like they might not make so much money, but they're like, it's a $5 pass line and $5 is a number. And so the pressing, you know, you could buy the four and 10 for like $5, you know, and the five and nine for $5. So it's like, the, you actually get paid way better than the, that's another reason to play it. You don't have to worry about mistakes on payouts, which can ruin the flow of the game. Um, yeah. The stick and the stick change doesn't seem to affect the game as much as on a regular table, although it still does. You got and no landmines, right? The only landmines are those plexiglass. They do stick up. Yeah. So I do catch them sometimes, like because I try to land them on the on that one rectangle, the plate that there's like you know that one section that's like a cut on both sides. That's like near the back wall. There's like a plate, right? Like in that middle, like I try to right in the middle. But one time, sometimes one of the die will hit right before there will hit, and it literally is like a back, it's like a wall. It hits it and it kicks in a different direction or stops. And when one die is doing something different than the other die, you know you're in trouble. So mm -hmm. I started getting seven outs that way. And that's what made me decide to go arc. So I will arc it. So I land it right before the back wall where there's a little bit of space, you know, after right. the cut. And so, um, and I listen to dealers. They'll tell me like somebody just rolled 39 rolls today. They rolled nine nines right before I got there. I'm like, what were they doing? They were like, well, they were doing it. They were landing right in that section right before the back wall. Right. I didn't know who that was or whatever, but I started doing it since that day. That was like December. Uh, um, late December. Right. So, 
Did yeah, they, like uh, uh, does the roll to win give you any heat of you setting the dice or taking it long or throwing it higher than their view, like how the live tables did to you at that casino? Oh yeah, like so. Right now, I got into a thing where you know I do um, I do fidget with the dice a lot. Like I'll I'll kind of like roll them, roll them, roll them over and over, and that's really for me to like you know when somebody's at the free throw line and they start bouncing the ball before they shoot the. That's my way to get my anxiety down and my rhythm. And sometimes um, I do get caught up in that, but nobody's ever told me that I'm taking too long. And I've only been told about the back wall, like probably twice in like been playing there for a year. And that's because like, you know, two or three in a row didn't hit, but that's not from throwing them up. I started doing this thing recently where I started rolling the dice. Um, I got in trouble at a casino one time in, uh, in Wilkes-Barre, right? There's a Mohegan there where, you know, they had the small, tall all. So I think I rolled the all. I remember like rolling the all and then I rolled the small or the tall. And what I was doing was I was taking the dice and I was, I was told I was spiking them. You know what that is? Spiking the dice? Yeah. No, no. What is that? So, I mean, this was like in 2015 or 16 and I would take the dice and I don't think I even, I think I just took them as they lay or whatever, whatever they gave me, uh -huh. um, as long as seven wasn't showing. And I would just like, I stand all the way at the far end of the table because I think I was getting too much heat about arc. So I would just roll them, but I would literally throw them like with a forward spin as hard as I could before the midline. So I was trying to roll them all the way down the table. And then a, and then the box person said, you can't do that. You're spiking the dice. I'm like spiking the dice. He goes, yeah, you're rounding off the edge by doing that. You're, you're getting rid of the, the sharpness. And I was like, so then I, then I realized, oh my God, that's, a, that's a thing. I didn't know that was a thing. I just did it, you know? So I started doing that now at the roll to win. And, um, cause you know, I wasn't having the best day setting the dice. So I said, let me try seeing if they say anything to me about this. So I started rolling them down the table, but I was set the hard ways and I threw like uh, three hard fours consecutive, like without an easy four um, when the point was something else. So before I even hit the point, I hit three hard fours like that. I'm like, wow, there's something up to this. And then um, the dealer's a really cool guy, this kid. He He's always like, I get a good vibe with him. I always catch a roll with him. So he yeah. goes, look, I, they're watching you. You got to hit the back wall, both dice. I'm like, I'm trying, but one of them keeps hitting where the plexiglass is raised. So like, one will make it and the other one will get caught. Um, so I realized he didn't say don't, he didn't say anything about spiking the dice because I, I have seen other people do that. So there, there is something to that. I don't know. I think when you roll it that hard and you're rolling it forward and you, you're minimizing like any sort of randomness, uh, you, you're actually minimizing randomness probably more than throwing them with arc because with that, that force and that roll forward, it just seems to have a longer roll. So I think I have like another uh, method to approach, like set the hard ways and just roll them as hard. But I'm going to disguise it. Instead of actually spiking them, I'm going to like go and roll them forward like this, where I hold them like this and then I toss them like this. But making sure they roll before the halfway point. It's something, it's something to do with that where now you have no arc. So my theory is either you have to have a lot of arc or like no arc. Because when you start getting like in the arc that most control shooters shoot i i literally just sit there and watch them like take all this time set the dice follow all the rules and throw like three four times a seven out and i think it's i just think it's like these people are you know early to the game they even yeah. though i haven't played consistently since 2011 i've always played for like you know three four months and then take a break three four months take a break yeah i get bored of it or <laughs> uh, run out of the extra let month. me test my audio um can you hear me okay on on, on my mic yeah, I hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I don't know if uh, people can hear me. Can you guys hear me better if I get closer to the mic? Um, just they said sounds like I'm a thousand feet deep in something. <laughs> you or me? Um, myself, I I believe. Uh, I didn't know I had audio issues. Uh, everything's up high. I hear you well. Um, now I can hear you better. Okay. I guess I had the mic too far away from my my uh, mouth, so I guess it's better now. Okay, good. They said perfect now. Okay. Hey, Seb, so 
I, I know you shared with me that you you believe you strongly believe uh and it is your belief that a lot of how you have attracted a lot of the hot tables or tables become hot is because of the energy and and how everyone believes in the table right can you elaborate a little bit more of your your philosophy of um, why you get more hot rolls than than cold rolls on that uh, on that um, you know that theory? So, like the reason I came upon this is because one of those uh, trips to Mohegan Sun in Connecticut on a Sunday, it was like particularly like a dead day, like nobody was catching a roll. And then people were, you know, getting to the gym. All of a sudden, this one woman showed up, and she was like a cheerleader. Like she was probably, you know, in her early fifties, and she would clap and she would just cheer anything. Like she's like, "Come on, shooter, come!" On. And we we hit a six. Like there was a guy that hit a six point fire bet. Literally, the first shooter when she arrived. So I noticed something there that like that. I asked that lady. I was like, you know, you brought it out. That guy wasn't even betting on the fire bet. You know, I put a dollar on it, so I get a thousand. So I'm like, so does you win a lot of fire bets? She goes, oh yeah, like me and my husband, like we, like I think I, you know, won more like more than on my hands. I won five, you know, six point fire bet, and my husband too, like because he'll bet it too. So I said, do you think it's like the is is you cheering? She goes, oh definitely. I come to a table, I'm always cheering. So I took that, you know, I took that advice and I tried that, and so I would get to a table and I would just I would cheer. Not like, you know, come on, shooter, come on, shooter. But I'd be like, okay, it's the number six and we want it hard. 33, Larry Bird, you know, or like 44, Jerry West for hard eight, you know, or, you know, and things like 55, stay alive. Like just like chance. Cause I kept going back to like, why did my brother and I were both random rollers? Why do we have such long rolls? It's because he kept saying that mantra. And I said, why did you do that? He goes to diffuse the negative energy of the pit bosses. So you have to confuse them, he said. If you confuse them, because did you watch that video I sent you about? Um, yeah, I yeah the the video you sent me that was very interesting. Of uh, so Seb sent me an, a video of was it a doctor or uh, like, yeah of the philosophy of power in belief in uh, um you know power of association you get like-minded people thinking the same there is there is a powerful energy in that right yeah yeah and then so i would tell the story about the the robotic arm right because he said that you know he had a patient that told him hey i just want to let you know that i'm a gambler and i throw the six more than any other number i tend to throw sixes and then i noticed that like you ever notice like some players throw a lot of field numbers and some players throw a lot of six and eights. And they could be random rollers. I'm talking about random rollers, not setting the dice. So so I was thinking, well, maybe that guy just, why would he throw a lot of sixes? So then then he talks about a story that there was a psych that guy's mentor or a book he read about a psychologist mm -hmm. that wanted to um, see if that's true. So he, he made a robotic arm. He had a robotic arm throwing. And he had a bunch of people stand at the table. And he told all of them. And I don't know if it's together or individually, but he told all of them to think of the number six while you stand at this table and the, and the random number generator of that arm throws the dice. And after he you know, analyzed all the data, that number six came out more than it should have in that like sample. And it was a pretty, uh, I don't know, hundreds of rolls, hundreds of throws of the dice yeah, like that. That was unbelievable <laughs> when I was listening to that. So it's like, it is crazy. Like, you know, if you're at the table, yeah. um, you know, no, like... And then see, he, like and then on top of that, he got another set of people um, who weren't gamblers, I think, and to think of the same, uh, a different number, and it, it showed up even more, right? Um, yeah. Which was very interesting. You guys got to check out that video. I'll put it in the link later. Um, and then he had intoxicated people. Yeah. And um, it didn't work with intoxicated people. And then he added caffeine to a group set of group people and bunches of six increased again. And it, it just shows that alcohol and gambling doesn't go together. 
and it actually becomes a depressant when when you have coffee or energy drinks brings up the excitement there's some kind of hidden energy which is pretty interesting um you can see how long even on the live and not and that opened my eyes because a lot of big roles come when the positive energy is there with the whole table you know um and you can notice how when you put the don't players on the table it's you know we always say don't don't dog the down the don't players but sometimes the don't players they may not be playing correctly i mean the the way you like but it does doesn't affect your bankroll but it does affect them the positivity of the table whether you like it or not well i'll right? tell you one yeah if i'm if a don't player stands next to me i can't throw well because i feel bad that they'll lose money and i'll make money partially i don't think it's their energy much as like i don't want this guy to lose 300 dollars when i win 40 dollars. you know so that's here's a funny story about that when i was first going to borgata back in 2011 um, you know, in AC. So I'm there, you know, and then this guy walks up. I guess he's like this uncle to this like kid who's just old enough to gamble. So he goes, this is the best bet in the house, kid. Watch. Um, I'm going to put $100 on the don't. I think he put $50 on the don't pass. And then, and he goes, I'm going to teach you how to gamble, kid. So I'm right there. And then the point is like four, right? And I throw a lot of fours. It just, I, I'm born on the 13th. So like, I know, like I, I four is like as easier to me than a six. So he goes, he goes, he goes to the, I says, um, I throw, I said, let's see what this guy does. He put like max odds. I guess it was $300. And then he put like a $50 hard four. So he goes, I throw a couple numbers, five, eight, nine. And then I'm like, okay. He goes to the kid. Okay. He's getting good. He's going to seven out any second. And then I'm setting the dice, right? So I go to the guy, Hey, sir, I just want to let you know, and you do with this, whatever you want, but I tend to hit a lot of fours. So you, I might, and I, and I can, I throw the dice. And I know what I'm doing. I don't want you to lose like three hundred uh, fifty dollars, like four hundred dollars here, because you know it's going to come easy for. He goes, eh, I don't believe in that. Throw the dice. I literally don't kid you not. Like two throws later, I threw an easy four winner, and the guy was like, he didn't know what to say. And then the kid goes like, this sucks. I hate this game, and he walked away. So I did that little kid <laughs> of never to gamble again. So, but th in that instance, you know that 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 was just like. I don't care, you know, who you are. I'm just letting you know that you can take that bet back. Now, you can't take that bet back on um, a roll-to-win table. You actually uh, don't pass as a contract bet. I think odds you can mm -hmm. lift. You can't lift that. So Don't pass. I, don't pass. You can take off. Not on the roll-to-win. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. And wow. you can't both of them at the same time either. <laughs> you can do a do you don't on the roll-to. See, I hardly play roll-to-win, so I, I wouldn't know. Oh, okay. But you know, so, uh -huh. yeah, the 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 don't players. I don't mind the don't players. I'm a, I'm a don't player myself. But you know, um, but you're hedging. Yeah, I'm hedging. I'm a hybrid, right? So, but yeah, the don't the don't players is it, it, just on the live table. I don't play. That's the reason why I don't play the don't because I strongly believe in the synergy and the the good energy in the table. It. It, I don't, you know, it, you can call it superstitious. I, yeah. I think energy is everywhere in in my own belief, and I I strongly agree with you, Seb. Positive energy is super important. At the least, if you don't believe it, it's more fun than a negative table, anyways, right? <laughs> it was like a Friday night, right? That's not the time to play the don'ts. It was a Friday night when this one don'ts play at that same casino that back before I got banned. And I was down hundred bucks or something, and I was just I got get mad. So I tend not to play craps mad, but when I play golf and I get mad, I get focused, right? Because it's at that point you're like done with the bullshit. I'm I, I'm I want to get serious now, right? So this guy, I, I crushed him. He was on the other side. He was right on, like he was exactly where the dice land, right? So I said to myself, I was having a bad day with the hard way, so all I did was flip him one time, right? If I flipped him one time. I tended to throw winners without sevening out. I hit three points. The last one was a 10. I took his entire winnings away. And I was from down 600, I was up like 600. So mm -hmm. at that point, I don't care who you are. You can't really get away with on a Friday night when there's music. The other thing is music. I know when the music comes, that's why I like going on Saturday nights and Friday nights. Because around nine o'clock, they have live music. Mm -hmm. Kid you not. 
I kid you not, the table gets hot when the music is on. And you know why it gets hot? Because I think it distracts all the negative thoughts and the fear and everybody there, like the workers. Like, you know, sometimes you don't know what that stick man is like. Like, there's this one stick guy who literally doesn't believe in setting the dice. And he's kind of rude about it, like the way he, you know, and even if the dice fall off the table, I'm like, same die, right? Like, I don't mm -hmm. know if you're into the same die thing, but I used to not be, but I yeah. stick to it more than else. And, and I think the most important reason is because if you've rounded out those corners and you're on a 20, 30 roll, right? I do believe that plastic table on the roll to win does, when, when you throw with like arc and they land really hard, you are rounding out those corners. So you want to keep those set of dice that are not going to shoot off in different directions. Well, you, you uh, want the consistency. I, I use the same dice because, and, and this is my own theory, the dice gets damaged from rolls and rolls and rolls from everything when you get a, a consistent roll why change the constant it's the same dice the, the chips the dings are going to be in the same place but if you change the dice now the dings are different areas scratches are different areas it it i strongly believe people don't look at the physicality of the dice could affect i'm not saying 100 percent but you want to still keep the constant as soon, I mean, even if the dice goes out the table, it might get a new chip, but on the dice, you know, a, a, a nick on the dice. But I, I think it's again, mental. You got to keep, you want to keep everything consistent. I think that's why, you know, people, it, it's, it's a huge mental game uh, of craps, like any sport, like they say it's 20% physical, 80% mindset. And, and it, I strongly believe with craps is is just the same, you know, how your positivity, how you carry yourself. Um, you know, a lot of uh, John from Pro Craps is one of my friends. He says it, it's not a negative. Um, and I agree with him uh, placing the seven. It, it's it's not. How do I put this? Can everybody on the table cheer if they're playing a different strategy? um no right. i mean if you're playing the don't you're not and is it right or wrong no it's not but what i strongly believe is if everyone is cheering together it gives you a stronger and better energy you know that's that's all it is i think you know nobody's rooting for anybody's bad but the more people you get on the same side it's the more positive what do you think Seb? Definitely. And, and, and I'll give you an example of this. This was the Caesars back in 2012 um, when I went down and with my, my 70 year old buddy. And uh, these kids were like 21 or 22. They all dressed up in suits and brought cigars and sunglasses. They looked like Mad Men, the show Mad Men or something. They, it wasn't even Halloween or anything. They was just like, they just decided that they're all going to wear the same exact suit and they're all going to smoke cigars. Well, that night, I remember catching like a 44 roll. And um, all I remember is of those four kids, they would each cheer each other on, right? So the first guy, he had like a 25 roll. Then the next three sucked. Then it goes around the table. The first guy sucked. The second guy had a 25, 30 roll. And it, then the next two sucked. Then it comes around. The first two sucked. The third guy catches a 30 roll, 35 roll, right? And then the next guy sucks. And then the next time it comes around, all three suck. And the fourth guy got the best roll of the night. He and then when we were in that, when we were cashing out, he came up to me. He goes, You were my inspiration. I'm like, What do you mean? He goes, Well, you rolled 44 times and I had to beat that. So I got to 46. And I was like, <laughs> Well, we all made money and that's all you need. And I said, There is something when you have your own crew of best, like best friends. You could tell they were all best friends. And when you, and I noticed that when I would see it, when I would see a bunch of guys, um, and it always used to be younger people just because. Like, that's that youthful energy, and that's that, like, you know, not like people have been playing craps for, like, you know, years and decades, and they're down, and they're kind of just thinking they outsmart the game. It's an energy game. Like my brother proved it to me the first time I played. So if I see friends on the same, come to a table together, even if it's just two, I'm like, now you're going to watch, the table's going to pick up. And of those two, both times, going to be one of those two guys going to catch a roll. And it happens. Because the other, if one guy sucks, mm -hmm. people are cheering on the other kid. And you don't want friends to be like like best friends to be on opposite sides of the table. I've noticed, and you don't want to split them. You don't want to be in between friends either. Like it seems to break um, 
their vibe, right? Because they, they're t- talking to each other. They have a flow. It, it is a craps game. I mean, technically, you know, we live we live in a universe that's a quantum quantum universe. So everything mm-hmm. is, is the observer. So like, you know, the Heisenberg principle about like wave and particle, it is the observer. You watch the movie Moneyball based on that book, right? If he watched the game, they would lose. Like they, they would almost lose until he left. So, so that mm-hmm. just tells you like, there is an observer effect. And if you, the don'ts better, they do get chased off tables. I've seen them. And I think that means the, the vibration of the table is higher than the don'ts vibrate, uh, vibration. The guy who really is a don'ts, not a hedger like you guys. Like he just wants mm-hmm. others. To, and then yeah. he'll bet on himself last line. Yeah, a, a lot there of... It definitely is. So, even the don't players mm-hmm. believe in energy. We, and, and I know a lot of don't players who strictly just play the don't they know when to leave the table because the energy, the positivity is just too strong for them. And they'll leave. Yeah. They'll know that. Um, but again, you know, Scraps is a social game. Uh, it, it, you, you do stick out. I mean, John always says he was cheer for the seven while, while cheering for a long roll. But in, in you you're like an kind of Im, an imposter, John. When you do that, you got nine people cheering really for the the pass line. Um, you're you can't genuinely cheer for them. You can be a cheerleader and keep it quiet, but um, it's like me and Jen giving uh, uh, silent knuckles when the don't comes. You know where we can't. Let's be truthful. We know the game. We know when we're gonna win. If you're on the don't. It's really hard to not uh, celebrate or cheer on somebody. It's you just hope for a lot of stuff, but uh, that I'm just gonna leave it at that. But yeah, you know, um, Seb, it, it's the energy can go both ways on, on both sides, and and I just don't know, know how to explain it. When I'm with Chef Dice and he's my wingman, and and we're on the table alone, we had some monster rolls together just because we trusted each other's toss and we knew we had our confidence in betting and there's no distractions we got the dice fast it was just me he's on stick right one i'm stick left one and our racks used to just fill up uh we did it once in reno we did it in vegas multiple times off camera and we just never did tell anyone it's like wow we made this much money you know we made this much money and and um it, it it's that s- synergy that you have and it's the more people get the more harder the synergy has to be because everybody got to be like-minded but it was really interesting what you told me about the, the, uh the observation of the positivity on the table yeah and and, and i was going to tell you uh when we talked about before about like you know like caffeine it, it helps you know and, and alcohol doesn't mm-hmm. um I, also notice that like chocolate so I, I say never be hungry at the table right he said never be hungry when you gamble but especially if you're like shooting so I, I i started noticing you know i'd be there four or five hours right i don't drink i don't take in anything that the casino offers i don't even buy their water because i don't know where that water comes from and if you understand water it carries memory like it, it can actually take on your energy and plus you know i don't want to drink out of plastic right i don't need any more microplastics in my system so I will, I will just drink my homemade water in the car. And then when I go in there, I'm just, I'm not taking in anything, but mm-hmm. I start bringing in my vape. Right. So I will, I will vape like THC and a funny story. <laughs> is, yeah. Like, you know why? Because you it really THC and then you throw the dice. Like, so I've noticed that for <laughs> yeah, it, it, it makes me like in a state of mind, you saw my name 420, right? So it makes me, <laughs> there's another guy that, so we go, you know, and the dealers and I know, like, you know, that they know what I'm doing. And, and, and yeah. they, we, talk, you know, what it is when we talk about it and we engage each other with the, the, the stick person, yeah. when you and stick person in something, then you're actually bringing their energy towards you. Like, like they're really not, like, they're not making money. And whether you tip them or not, they don't even care if I tip sometimes because I will tip, but sporadically. Because if you tip consistently, that, that doesn't help. Well, you. a lot of people in the comments are talking about tipping and how it's important. Um, they always tip. Oh, tipping the shooter. Do you tip the shooter? Um, I, I mean, I, if, I, if somebody makes me money, I'll give them money. I'll just, like, you can't really do it with the roll to win. So you can't tip the shooter. <laughs> yeah. You can't, so, you can't tip yeah. them on the road to win. I, 
I think yeah, but I'll do it on Crapsy now. <laughs> Crapsy, you're right. So, yeah. um, that, so I noticed that that one day um, I tried this other thing. I took a nicotine patch, you know, and I just cut it into a small section where I'm probably getting a milligram of nicotine on the patch. And I know that like one thing it did to me, you know, it makes you more focused, but cause I don't smoke or anything. I don't vape nicotine, but I said, let me try the patch. It's supposed to augment your, augment your brain. Like nicotine actually does in small amounts is good. It's okay for you. So I started to get really hungry. So I said, the next time I went, I brought like little chocolates, you know, like little single serving, like Snickers. And I noticed that if I was eating constantly right before my roll, I would eat like, I would eat one piece of chocolate. And that day, like that made the difference. Like my blood sugar didn't drop, you know, because you have to remember you're a machine. You got to feed machine and chocolate actually has more, you know, chemicals in it for focus. Like dark chocolate can actually focus you. Um, but in all chocolate yeah, has some. Yeah, that to my wife. My wife's going to yeah. have dark chocolate always on the craps table now. <laughs> yeah. They don't, they don't mind me. So I don't make a mess. And um, I know that that with nicotine um, worked. And then one day uh, the table sucked. It was a Sunday. Nobody could catch a roll. Not the, not the control shooters, not the random rollers. So when it came to me, I'm like, okay, I haven't hit my pen yet today. Right. So I went and I hit it like five times hard. And at that point I was, I was like floating kind of, you know? So (laughs) when I, I was like, I had this confidence in me that I just knew that nothing can stop me right now. And I rolled 10 pass lines. So I started out, you know, and I set the sevens on the come out. So I threw seven, yo, seven, yo, seven. And then the point was four. I rolled 22 rolls, 10 10 blue numbers, right? And then three hard fours consecutive, like, you know, without an easy four. So Mm -hmm. that, that to me enhanced me, right? It, it, you know, cause you have to understand the human brain, we don't even access what we are capable of. So if you point that you start meditating, like you meditate before you go play, but the thing is every, if you see what you do is you have a, you have your own crew, right? When you mostly have Mm -hmm. your friends from Hawaii and then you have where you are alone and you're with this other crew. And I will tell you, you always do better when you have your crew of friends that you know from Hawaii. Mm-hmm. then when you invite a new person to join that kind of wants to play because the thing is he might that person might be nervous and the other person might be like is this guy going to make me money or lose money right mm-hmm. and that's it's like it's like a team right you know when you watch baseball teams and stuff like yeah. in, you win the championship when that other team had the better players statistically right right i, I believe the same thing with craps so you reserving a table it really i, I think that if you try this out or something like that, where you, everybody's got to come in there. Like, I think like that one guy came off a plane or something like you gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta get, you gotta take a shower. You gotta like, you know, <laughs> not saying like, you gotta clean off all the energy that you were on that plane. You know, you were yeah. tired. You gotta freshen up. You know, you gotta be like, yeah. I'm like a born Refresh, child. Ready to go. You know, a lot, a lot of my, my big roles is off camera because I, I I just get flustered with with running running the recordings and all that. But yeah, um, I I now now that I think of it, every time when I have a a jacket roll, forty plus roll or, or a long roll, my focus, I like I'm in the zone, like you know. And when you're in that zone, like nothing distracts you, and and all you think about is that long roll. But there were times when I, I'm setting the dice and I'm thinking, and I start thinking, and I catch myself doing this, no seven, no seven, go for the jacket, no seven, and once I do that, sure enough, the seven comes out. This the mind is so strong that once one speck of negativity, man, it just it can hear you, man. <laughs> it just changes yeah. that one thing, you know. But if you don't think, if I don't think about that seven and I think about more positive, how perfect the dice is going to look and I, you know, have, have, um, I envision it, then I go for a longer consistent roll. But once my mind gets offset and I think, okay, no seven, what I got to do to the, oh, I said the set, you know, and I'm not even saying it out loud. It, it happens. It's just strange. And, 
And uh, one of our shooters, Alan G, he always says five right back or whatever the point back. And he, he, he does this to psych him up and to trick his mind uh, to stay consistent. And he has a golden arm jacket. He rolled for over an hour. He has a Fremont jacket. He rolled for over 40 rolls all in, in, in one trip and multiple long rolls. And he's very consistent, but he strongly believes in that mindset too. So that it is crazy uh, how the mind can play tricks on you. Right. Yeah. And, and I think like to me that, that, that means your concentration has now run out. When you start to think, when those when those intrusive thoughts come in, you you have to do something to like counteract them. So what I'll do is I'll throw them off the table. You know, I'll just throw them off the table. That just gets rid of everything, and that works. Like I don't I don't think I've ever seven out after doing that. Except one time I had to throw them off the table twice, because why the first time then a stick change happened. Right. So if I like the stick person. That's that's me, right? I'm I know I'm not gonna seven and I don't. And I keep track of different stick people, and there's one stick person I've never seen any shooter ever seven out when she comes in. Every other stick person has at one point been a and then there's some people are constant seven outers when they check in. It doesn't matter who the shooter is. So if you get a negative thought, that's when I do my thing. Like when I start to twirl the dice, I twirl them. Like say, you know, I, I twirl them a one full rotation. So if it's a hard eight, I'll twirl them until the four, four shows again. And then I throw them. But if I get a negative thought in my head or I think of a pattern, like the waitress comes around, right? Like the beverages, you know, they say that that's a thing, right? Well, yeah. I noticed the stick change, right? The stick change and the waitress are yeah. like, so what I'll do is I'll throw them off the dice, which buys time. Because what happens is she's distracting the other. Everybody has to be focused. All the players have to be focused or if they're chit-chatting, you know, it's positive talk. Um, but you have like, you know, that. And that, that, what, what, so what sticks to that? So I will I will I'll roll them like I'll do two rotations, you know, and then. That'll diffuse that negative thought. And now, I, you know, like base, like baseball players do, that. they have their rituals on the mound, on the batting box. Golfers, tennis players, like Rafael Nadal never touches the white line ever. You know, he jumps over them and he drinks the water a certain way. I mean, it's insane, but like he's one of the best of all time. But like even the best of all time do irrational things because they have negative thoughts creep in their mind and their rituals diffuse the anxiety. So for mm -hmm. me, it's like, and nobody's told me you're taking too long with the dice. I'll have a, I'll have a player cr uh, complain, stop twirling the dice, stop making love to the dice, you know, but then they watch me roll and then, and then they're like, they have nothing to say. So and the other thing I was telling you the other day about yesterday what was, was that guy. There's always, sometimes there's one guy that you could have nine, like, uh, you know, it's 10 spots at that table. You could have nine spots full of positive people. And then you got the one complainer, right? So the complainer, mm -hmm. Like all he does is complain. When things are good, he's quiet, right? But when, when he he misses a roll, it, you know, it's it's funny because as soon as he walks away, the table lights up every time. And when he's there, it's like the dice want to go. They want to go for thirty, but they can't get past sixteen because he's there. And that, yeah. that I I know those kind of guys, man. It's like, yeah, you're shooting a good roll, but you're not hitting any of my numbers. You know, yeah. <laughs> those kind of guys. Like, yeah, you're in a 36 roll, but you miss my numbers. You you know, you like good roll, so it's like got negative positive. <laughs> yeah, you're still complaining, man. <laughs> and, and that guy will like he'll walk up, and he's a nice guy. He's literally a nice guy. And yeah. It's like, it's not like he's just a he's like a kind of a, a just a just a, a you know a loud <laughs> just a a nitty not nitty but like not naggy either but just a complainer and it's not yeah, like yeah. he's on but he'll be he'll bet the ten right and five fours come yeah and he's complaining oh I got a single ten five fours I'm like well why wouldn't you bet the four and the ten you know <laughs> you know like you gotta why? give them a name for those kind of guys like. Uh... Bet the six and eight, and the outside come and they start complaining. Anybody got a name for that? It's like, and they, and then you're on a you're a good role. It's a good quality role, but you just didn't hit the numbers because he just bet two numbers. You know, yeah. <laughs> that you know, and it's I, the shooter's I, fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's always yeah. joke says, So well, bet more numbers then. <laughs> you know, I mean, and. The thing is, you know, they know that you're setting the dice and they know you're a good roller. But it's like I, I sometimes want to have a talk with people like this because, well, actually, like more recently, when I'm at the table, I just say whatever I want to people. 
there was a guy, he was standing next to me saying seven out, seven. He was betting the don'ts on me and he had a hundred dollars on the don'ts. And the point was six. And I was like, look, man, six is really easy. I don't, I suggest you go with me and not against me because I know, I know you're a good shooter. You cost me like $1,200 on your last roll. You hit so many like come out sevens and points. I'm like, yeah, cause I was trying to hit the seven on the come out. I tried to do that on purpose. So he wouldn't listen to me. Right. And I was like, you, I said, and I, I suggest you, um, you probably should hedge with the hard six because um, I'm, I'm probably going to throw it this time. And, and he didn't listen to me and I threw the hard six winner. So he was down like, you know, a bunch of money, four or 500 bucks. So the next time, it was right away it was eight and i said are you gonna go with me or are you gonna go against me because as i'm rolling he's talking to me in my ear like right next to me and most people would be like shut up dude like yo that could be like, you could leave the fight right? and he and he yeah. was down money drinking but i you know, i'm not like that right because i vape thc when you vape thc like you're not in the mood to fight you're you're just you're, you diffuse yeah. that so i actually i hit he went with me and i hit the eight easy and and the thing was, like, I, I I will just talk to people while I'm rolling. I'm like, you want to see me roll 35? And I was like, I'm going to, you know, in the 30s, I'm going to do it right now. And I don't know what it is. It's like for some people it's coffee or some people it's a little bit of alcohol. But, like, with me, when I vape THC and I eat chocolate, like, I, I'm already in a, in an altered state, right? I'm not nervous anymore. I'm happy. I'm here, I'm here to play a game. That's the most important thing that I think people forget. You're here to have fun. The first time you made money is because you had fun and you made some money, right? Now we're all like, make money. No, you get, like what you try to do, you're always trying to, I hear you, you're laughing, you're, you're, you're joking with everybody. You're trying to raise the vibration and get rid of the fear. And then, like really fear is negativity, right? So you're getting rid of the anxiety. But I don't think everybody's paying attention that when they're rolling dice. So I always tell people like, you got to bring a crutch with you. And for me, it's like, you know, something my, my vape pen or my chocolate, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and I stopped being a leader because when I was a cheerleader, I was not a good shooter. Like, so all the energy I was hearing everybody else during their roles, when I got mm -hmm. to my role, I, I think I burned myself out. Um, <laughs> oh, the other, never talk during your role. Never, because I, I you talk or someone to someone talk to you. You know, um, like, I for Rob, Roberto, I got mad at him at the last trip because he was talking to our our friend uh, SJ. He was kind of drunk. Uh, Roberto brings a lot of energy, um, but he kept on talking to him while he was setting the dice and throwing. I said, "Dude, you gotta you gotta be quiet." It's like a, a golfer taking his swing his back swing and you're talking to him and yelling it out <laughs> yeah and he, he didn't realize he was uh just talking about that but it was it was just hilarious because he just was having so much fun you know but yeah i'm um, talking and well some people talk to themselves though uh like alan g he'll he'll say five right back he'll get into uh uncle hoku talks to himself but it's, it's no, no, not, not that kind I... of talking you're talking about right yeah, what I, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, I'm talking about like you as a shooter talking to other people. Like, my mistake is when I when I usually when I get there for like my first roll, I'm silent, right? And then I start to get to like 16 or I get to 24, and then I start to talk. Like, I'll say to the dealer, I'll say something, and that just broke the pattern. The pattern that was working was me not talking to anybody. Um, that's for me, you know, but like, if you start to roll out talking, like you're just talking to everybody, like that's, you're already in that mindset where talking is okay. But what I mean is like that, what I mean is don't do anything different than when you start the roll. So uh, what I, one thing I noticed is that, cause you know, you, you're different when you're going there, you have a crew, you know, the dealers are kind of with you, but you have to remember like the box person's not with you. The pit boss not with you. Like nobody else is with you guys. They don't really want you to win. Just the dealers like the tips, but in the end of the day, they really, you know, I don't think they care if you win. They just want the tips, right? So you can buy them. You can kind of buy their energy. <laughs> you can but buy them. <laughs> you, but when it comes yeah. to, um, for me, when it when it when it comes to like trying to diffuse, uh, like I believe that when 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 you're t when we're talking, right? Like you know, you like you don't see tennis players or golfers like talking while they're swinging, right? You know, like right. so. When we're throwing the, not that we're talking with throw the dice, but even in between, it's, it takes you out of that. If you're in the alpha wave state, you know, alpha wave is the meditative state. 
And um, there's certain supplements you can take, like uh, theanine, right? Like that's why I like drinking tea. Tea has this molecule called theanine, and theanine actually gets rid of anxiety and increases focus. So, and then it puts you into alpha wave, and alpha wave is the zone. You know, that's where like Tiger Woods, you know, he would he was he would get into a meditative state before he was he actually was like partially hypnotized by by a, a military psychologist. He was he would forget. Really? Yeah, if you read his book, like one of the many books, I read the one, the one right around the scandal time. Um, I think it was written by one of his swing coaches, and he talked about how his father was always, you know, watching him, and there would be a psychologist, and he would forget the whole match. Like Tiger didn't remember what happened; he just shot a ridiculously low score because he was in the zone from the beginning. So, I mean, the thing about dice, I do believe that there is, you know, you can influence them and get a one to two percent advantage. And if you're in a particularly good zone, you could even bump that advantage up to like 10%, you know, when you're like, when you're just on fire. So for me, I noticed that, oh man, once I start talking, cause I get comfortable, right? Like the nerves are gone. I've rolled like 25 times, but like if I smoke, you know, if I do the THC, it actually makes me quiet. So that, that, that gets rid of that. And THC does put you in the alpha wave state. That's what people don't understand is like, um, THC plus CBD is alpha wave. Um, so honestly, there's so many tricks to like take advantage of this brain of ours that's powering this human body. And I think that a dice lot of ways, could... a lot of different ways to stimulate the mind, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely not alcohol. Though, I'll say that unless it's like one drink, right? Like that one shot, yeah. you know, with... one shot to get you going and relax. But after that, you can't have any more. Oh yeah, why do you think they give up free drinks, man? Uh, the the yeah. casinos know that too. They they want to yeah. take you off the game, um, uh, so you can misjudge. It, it's just part of the whole. Cause if you're on the trying to provide that experience from the casino side, that's the alcohol is they're there to take your money and and to the alcohol helps them uh bring out the wallets, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think it's like sitting if you can sit at the table it's you you'll actually you'll do better shooting the dice if you're sitting when you're not shooting oh when you're not shooting in between rolls yeah like i know i think i see there's one of those players that doesn't have a chair yeah yeah because he's older right so like yeah and roll to win you can have a chair because there's no chips right chair. i found oh, that like okay. i'm sitting i'm way more fresh to throw the dice yeah, I'll sit. I'll sit because I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to get tired before my roll. But I will stand one shooter before my roll. I will start standing to get the yeah. blood flowing. You know, the other um, thing is, yeah. down, I noticed that, like, because when I vape, I gotta walk down into the smoking section, right? So I noticed that, like, stagnation, even sitting all the time, doesn't help. Or you know, you have to walk around to keep the keep everything moving, your legs moving, the blood flowing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. You gotta, you gotta do all that. You know, it's, <laughs> it's yeah. amazing. Well, if you, um, uh, we're, we've been talking for about an hour and a half now. Can you believe that Seb? <laughs> yeah. I, I believe it. I can about traps. Yeah. You guys have any questions in the chat? A, a lot of people, um, agree with the mindset, agree with the good karma on the table. Um, you guys have any questions you guys can put in the, in the chat now for Seb. Um, I, I know one of them was uh, the dice set. Um, let me see which was that question from uh, John Norris a while back. He says, how do you hold your dice and where do you throw to on the table? Do I want my dice to backspin or no? That's what his question is. Ah, uh, yeah, so... I, I went through so many, like when I got back in the game a year ago, I tried different things. So I would, um, I was struggling with the standard, you know, you got the, I usually will have, um, like the three fingers with the, with the thumb. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I started sometimes all my whole hand, you know, I've done like the golden touch thing. I find it's whatever's working for you at the time. So I'll, I'll switch it up. I even did like the stacking and then with the stacking, I would turn one of them. So it would be like, you know kind of like offset where one of them is, you know, like a diamond in the middle of a, a rectangle. Um, but I always use hard ways. Um, 
and when I'm setting, uh, I've done the 3V. Um, I don't like to go for the 3V as much because I really like to throw any number that comes out, you know, in the field. Um, come out roll, like I said, is I'll set the sevens um, with the sixes on the side, you know, in, on the left and the one on the right showing. Or I'll set the yo and the ace deuce with the four showing on both sides um, mm -hmm. to try to come up with seven traps. Uh, with me on the roll to win, it to me I find closer to the back wall is actually better than too far away from the back wall, um, and of course arc. Um, I find that I find that literally thinking you're playing like like horse horseshoe kind of thing or like you know oh sorry when you go to the carnival right and you're trying to throw the softball into the bottles. Yeah, yeah, the milk bottle, the milk cans, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking is like I'm trying to land this in a little circle and I'll, I'll pick that little spot. I'll stare at that spot and I'll try to land <laughs> I do spot. that too. I, I have that cookie jar. I imagine a cookie jar that I used to do a challenge that I have to throw it into this bowl. I envision a cookie jar every time when I throw that I'm going to get it into there. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Uh, oh, dark what? chocolate or milk chocolate? What kind of chocolate do you you eat, John Crosense is? Uh, like, the, I mean, the day that I did this, I just brought a bunch of like Milky Ways and must Mars bar, like individual sample size packs. Like, so I was eating, I was eating them all. I didn't care. Um, I think you got to eat what you like, but some of them were dark chocolate Milky Ways. So maybe that's what did it because I know I was eating those too. <laughs> I, I have no effect on uh, ch chocolate has no effect on me. Not that I know of that. I just eat it. It's good, you know, but uh, Keely says dark chocolate. If you want to lie to yourself and say it's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> RT wants you to take off the bandana. He, uh, I don't know. RT says DJT. Um, uh, John, well, what are the reasons? Two, one, two, I three. Can. Yeah. Is another with my day job. It's kind of like high profile, so I don't want to get recognized that you know by somebody that like a client, you know. So that's another yeah. reason because you know, right? So and people might judge you for you know gambling essentially. So that's another. Reason. Yeah, our, our, our one of my friends, Greg from Five Five Five, had to take down his channel because of his day job. Uh, they they said it was a conflict of interest. So uh, he oh, had wow. great content, but. Again, um, and that's why I go by the name of Money Shot because of my profession as well. I, I do have clients. Um, I'm in real estate, and I in the beginning I didn't want it to interfere with my professional business. So you know, yeah, yeah. no worries. You know, um, I might. I'm just, um, what is I'm I am thinking about doing hidden camera. So hidden I might. Camera? Get, yeah, now you're and gonna like, get you know, really going kicked out if you get you you get caught. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, 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 you know, a lot of these casinos won't allow it, right? So it's like, but I think, you know, you see the card counters kind of do the hidden camera stuff. And I think it, yeah, it, it would kind of... I don't, think, I don't think it's worth it to do that unless... I mean, what what would be your purpose for that? Uh, just to kind of see, like, and, and post it to show that, you know, dice control is a thing. Because a lot of people don't want to, you know, believe it, per se. So right. probably just to see if, like, the observer... The other thing is like, cause you're recording, right? Like I, I, one thing I noticed is, and this is maybe a quirky thing, but the day that that guy rolled that 72 and you know, I had rolled 71, I had rolled the, um, and the funny thing is three rolls later, a guy rolled 41. Wow. So mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and apparently the guy who rolled the 71 two days before rolled a 51 and three rolls later was a 44. So so it doesn't, the table can stay hot. It's not like you get this monster roll and it just cools off because you had, there's something about the roll to win where it can just stay hot. So um, I had my forgotten my phone in the car and it was too far in the parking lot for me to go back. So that day that all this great stuff happened, I didn't have my cell phone on me. And that made me wonder sometimes that does, does the cell phone itself, like fidgeting with it, looking at it, throw off your concentration somehow where like, you know, because I would take pictures of the numbers i would take pictures of the screen and nobody says anything because you're allowed to um you just yeah, can't record think, yeah roll two in i don't think they, they bother a lot yeah um, yeah you just can't record video but you could take pictures so i would do that to keep track of the numbers and see mm -hmm. you know what, what should i have done betting wise in the whole day but that mm -hmm. day i forgot it it was the best day so i thought is that do you want like you ever think about 
turning off the phones or putting them in airplane mode. Because you have to remember, cell phones put out frequencies. And those frequencies, like that's why you shouldn't sleep with a cell phone. You're too intense for me, Seb, with all that (laughs) frequencies. Well, that that's what I'm a scientist, so by nature, and I'm I'm you know I believe I believe in both luck and I believe you make your luck, but I also believe in like physics and science. And I believe we live in a world where like you know our brains are being saturated with distractions. So um, I have yet to repeat that because I'm kind of hooked on the cell phone, but I'm going to try it again and see if the uh, the pattern repeats. That's interesting. Well, you know, uh, learned a lot. I mean, uh, you. you I, and I appreciate you for sharing your time and 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 your thought process. Everybody has a unique style. Um, you you did get banned from that casino for for them saying that you're 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 throwing too good. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. It wasn't it wasn't made up. Um, but um, you know, I, I appreciate you, Seb, coming out um, and sharing all of your stories and and especially the mindset, which, you know, I always say it's, it's very important, but not so many YouTubers or, or dice controllers uh, really touch or mention of how important it is. You got anything yeah. to, else to say to everyone in the chat? No, I'm just, um, thanks for listening, um, asking questions. And, you know, um, you know, and I think the most important thing is just have fun. And, you know, like, you know, we're all human. We, we point seven out all the time, you know, like obviously I point seven out all the time too. And you just got to get back on your horse and try again. But if you're in a rut, switch things up, you know, don't be rigid, be willing to change your mindset. Like that's how you succeed in your life. You have to adapt, you know, and if you don't adapt your style, if you're, if something's not working, be willing to change. And that's how you keep the game like fresh for you, like you still to enjoy the game and also the mystery of like all of this, like the mystery of when you have a monster role. So just try to, just try to enjoy the game no matter what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, and if you can't get your mindset straight and you're having challenges doing that, um, then maybe it's time for a break until you, you know, you're ready. Right. If you're not confident on a table and I always say this, you know, how do you play on the bouncy table? How how you, if you have a choice, don't play on it. Go to a casino that you're good at because you, your confidence level is already low. Why put yourself in that situation? And, and you do have a choice of when you want to play and when you don't want to play, you know, unless you're filming like me, but uh, <laughs> you got to. You, you got to listen to yourself and, and stay confident and psych yourself up like everything, like my son wrestles and I say, I, I always tell him, your mindset has to be strong. You got to go in as if you won the match or, or have that confidence because you cannot lose the match before even the match started. And a lot of yeah. people do that. Um, their mind is not strong enough and and they wonder why the negativity sticks with them. You got to learn how to get rid of them. Uh, I preferably by meditation and not so much by chemicals <laughs> and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, the important thing is keeping, um, you know, uh, keeping your mindset clear, have fun, all the positivity and everything. Um, so, yeah, John Crosan says, thank you. Um, James says, please do do this again. Oh, they enjoyed you, Seb. Oh, Everything. wow, nice. <laughs> Everything is sure. gone. Yeah, uh, yeah or lost his mind. I thought, I thought I was like, poor Seb, he's going to get bashed. But you know what I love yeah. about the HCS crew and the HCS viewers, man? Uh, they give you the benefit of the doubt. And, um, they, you know, if they don't like something, they'll say it in a nice way. They, they share their own views. Uh, but... This community is pretty awesome there. They, they just, you know, and um, I'm glad you're willing to have the courage and confidence to come on my channel and <laughs> share. You know? yeah. Anytime. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Having me. Yeah, you, you had fun. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, we'll call it a day. It's been a uh, um, thank you again, Seb. We'll talk more um, later on. Maybe we'll get you back on the show maybe in the future. But we want to thank you guys, all you guys, viewers, for jumping in and sharing uh, the experience with uh, Seb here. All right. Take care. And may the dice be nice. Aloha, guys. Aloha. Bye-bye.